And uh, please avoid any conversation about the election until after we're done all of this. And then we'll have the whole discussion about the election. So I guess this evening in Beers with Bill, been here before, good friend, a little bit of a badass. <clears throat> Brent Navarro, Beer Diversity. Uh, welcome to Beers with Bill. Those of you who are just joining me, uh, the order of beers tonight, we're going to start with the Midnight Bike Club, which is um, Rob's pick for summer IPA. So, Ren, take it away. Uh, I'm barely talking about the beers. So, uh... <laughs> no, you talk about what you want to talk about. I got some questions for you, but we'll get to them. Yeah. Um, so hi, everyone. I thank you for bringing me back. I just I love this. So uh, yeah, I'm Ren. I run Beer Diversity. Uh, it's been two and a half years. And I'm avoiding the election tonight because I think that I'll just wait till tomorrow. Uh, if the world is still turning, then I will take it as a good sign. But uh, in the meantime, I am working on bringing diversity to not just beer, but wine and spirits. So in my spare time, I kind of nerd out. So I've got two certifications for beer, one from Cicerone, one from Prudhomme. Uh, Prudhomme's Canadian, Cicerone is international. And then I have W set level two for wine. And I'm currently working on my foundations of distilling through the Institute of Brewing and Distilling, which is in the UK. So um, that's, that's been my like pandemic things. And I'm like, I'm gonna learn about distilling. And distilling is not as fun as it sounds. So uh, I'm currently struggling to get through that. <laughs> it's a lot of work when you do, you're doing distilling. Yeah, and I'm only doing the foundation. So it's like a high level thing. It's not even like the math yeah. parts of it. And I'm still like, I don't know what I'm reading. So it's, uh, it's great. Well, you answered a few of the things I wanted to talk about, but a lot of things have happened since the last time you were on the show in June. I want to know how you're doing. I'm good. Um, so last time I was on, I was had finally just started really working again. So the first three months of the of the pandemic, like most people, I just I didn't have a job. So I uh, was trying to figure out how to shut down my company. And then the George Floyd video happened and suddenly I was popular, um, a little too popular for my liking for the first while. But um, business was was booming. So I was doing a lot of sessions all on Zoom with breweries and schools and tech companies and you name it and they probably reached out to me and the great thing about it so from June until the beginning of October I basically got to talk internationally so everywhere from across Canada to different parts in the states to um, New Zealand and uh, a little bit uh, across the UK so it's uh, yeah it was, it was pretty good and now I'm slowing down uh, I think that people are kind of in this weird, like the world is terrible and it's really, it's really hard to still care about black people and indigenous peoples. Um, so I'm definitely not doing as many of those things, but I am working on an inclusion toolkit for breweries, which had been a plan from, I don't know, April. So, <laughs> so I'm finally working on that. So I'm really good. I'm, I'm excited to be finally working on this stuff. I'm glad to hear that things are going well, so, you know, We've uh, crossed paths a few times on Messenger, but you know it's it's good to hear things are moving along and moving well for you. Yeah. What's the most exciting thing that's happened over the last five months? Ooh, um, the most exciting thing, I think, um, getting to to speak at Fresh Fest, which is uh, the Pittsburgh Beer Festival, which is it highlights black people in beer and it's open to everyone. Um, and this year, obviously they had to go virtual, but I was actually invited to speak. And that was pretty trippy because, you know, I was again, the only Canadian getting to speak to uh, not just an American audience, but like a worldwide audience. So that was one of the best things. And then I also got invited to speak at Terroir and the food industry is like, they're the cool kids and I don't get to sit at that table. So getting invited to, to speak for, for a bit of that was, was pretty darn awesome. Yeah, I, um, I trolled you on, on the internet, like I do everybody, my guests. Uh, I really enjoyed that Food Network Insider interview that you did. 
Yeah, the one that says that I'm from Kitchener. <laughs> yeah, I laughed when I read that. <laughs> <laughs> my my Toronto friends were really mad about that, <laughs> and I said I didn't I didn't say it. She just wrote it, so it must be true. <laughs> That was that was that was cool too because they just they reached out to me. They just, I got a message one day and they're like, "Can we talk to you?" And and did this like kind of sneaky pre-interview with me and they're like, "Yo, we want to write an article on you." And I was like, "Oh, oh, okay." So it was um yeah, it was cool to show up in in Food Network Canada because again, like, these aren't things I'm expecting and I'm not I'm not putting it out there that I'm like, please come and interview me. So yeah, it was it was a really great thing this year. Yeah, that's good. You just recently did a photo shoot and those pictures, like I said earlier, fantastic pictures you did on-site shooting. What was the vibe like being in those spaces after everything that's been going on with COVID-19? Um, it was weird as hell. So it was four different locations. So if you don't know her, Mona Musa, um, kind of woman around town does quite a bit, runs KW Joy & Co, which is a new online magazine, but also does photos. And she's a woman of color. So if you're looking to work with BIPOC photographers, she is fantastic and redid my photos recently. And uh, Ryan is also a great photographer who's on. Hi. Um, so part of it, so I went to uh, Rich Uncle and like all of these places were closed. We went on a Monday. So it didn't feel like COVID <laughs> to, to be able to like, walk around and be like, I'm gonna move this thing and I'm gonna sit here. And like, doesn't matter if I do this. So it, it was almost this weird, like normal moment going in and taking photos and then kind of having this like memory of like oh yeah we have to wipe this down when I walk away from this and so it was it was you know this this weird moment where it's like yep COVID says that I I have to clean what I have touched um but part of doing it too is that I just wanted to highlight my friends and their spaces so uh we we shot at Rich Uncle, Arabella Park, TWB and then ended at Shortfinger and I just really wanted to, to have photos that if you know where these places are, you're like, oh yeah, I know. And for people who didn't know, it was really great to say, oh yeah, that photo's at Short Figure. Like that comfy chair is there. Um, so it just, it, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to be able to kind of like sneak my friends in and their places and, and just kind of give them a nod. Gerard just flipped up a question. Um, how do you keep motivating yourself to learn about the different kinds of alcohol versus going super deep into just one of them? Uh, um, I, I think I went super deep into beer and it got to the point where you start getting pigeonholed and then people assume that you only drink beer. And I've been a wine drinker longer than I've been a beer drinker. So I just wanted to kind of prove it. And part of like the unfortunate reason for me collecting certificates and certifications isn't because I'm interested. It's because I need people to trust me. And as a black woman in alcohol, people do not believe that I can speak to something. I still have people asking, do you really drink beer? And I had a sales rep ask me that during a sales meeting where he had brought me samples and just didn't let me open them while he was there because he didn't believe I was going to touch them. So um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of, yeah, so it's a little bit of both. I'm, I'm a bit of a nerd and I just want to know about stuff, but it's also so I can prove, prove to people that uh, I know what I'm talking about. Wow. It is such a shame that in this day and age, you still have to deal with those type of sort of microaggressions with racism. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Ryan, Ryan put a picture of the big comfy chair in the, the chat. It's really the most comfortable chair on earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's the biggest change over the last five months for you? Um, I think I'm at the point where I'm not here to, I finally realized and also allowed myself to not be a people pleaser. I think that that prior to COVID, I was very like, I have to be approachable and I have to be that, that friendly black woman who's like, come on, ask me whatever you want. Um, I, I told someone today who, who got referred to me, like just, you know, white guy at a brewery was like, you should talk to Ren. And it was like, you're a black woman, Ren's a black woman, you should talk. And I said, when you see him next, tell him to go fuck himself. And uh, I think that five months ago, I wouldn't have said that. So <laughs> I'm just at this point where it's like, my time is very important and I need people to understand that 
I want to answer questions and I want to help out, but if you're going to waste my time, like I'm going to tell you, you're wasting my time. So I think that's the biggest change. Interesting. Interesting. I, you know, I, I don't always respond when you're on Facebook and you do something, but I've read some of those posts and I'm just like, wow, people have pushed just a little too hard. Yeah. Those are always really weird. Cause I forget that my mom's my Facebook friend. And I will post <laughs> like these giant rants and I'll just get a text being like, you good? Cause you sound good, but I got to make sure you're good. Cause my mom is like, so used to me just being like, ah! and uh, so I think she's, she's really enjoying that. I'm putting it out there and saying like, you know, black lives matter is not a passing fad. If you can't be behind it, then you're telling me I shouldn't live. So like, you know, and then it's just a lot of like F words, but um, it's, it's very like, if you don't want to do this, you don't have to, but it means that we can't be friends. You've done work with a number of uh, breweries on collapse, particularly for the, um, um, there it is, it eluded me completely. The last one that you did was <coughs> with uh, short finger TWB Graham at uh, Counterpoint. Are there collabs coming up in the future? Yeah, um, I didn't think I was gonna do a lot of collabs. I thought it was just gonna be the um, Black is Beautiful, which was that, that collab. Um, because I was like, well, it's it's COVID and it's a pandemic. And like, who's making beer? Who's doing collabs? Like, whatever. So the collab counter is is ticking. Um, Nothing Civil, which was my collab with Wellington, Truth Is, and um, Lexi Fam just came out again. So that's part two. The first one got released, and it turned out that it was Welly's fastest selling one off, according to Marvin. So when it got released on a Friday, it was gone by Wednesday. And that was a thousand cans. So wow. they did a 4,000 can release and they are saying to people, hurry up and get it. Um, I went out and bought a two four because they were like, we can get you some. And I was like, nope, I'm just going to buy it. So I have it. Uh, so I bought a two four because <laughs> because the last time I got five cans out of the first release. So um, so that one and that, you know, we're calling that liquid protest. And that's been really well received. And if you haven't seen the label of that, it's not messing around. Uh, I know that Emma's got it. It's there's guns and dogs and nooses and a poem by by truth is that is absolutely amazing. Um, and then if you really pay attention to the label, there are names of murdered black people within it, uh, within the patterns. So we really made it that it was not just I'm having a beer. There was like so much more to it. Um, I did Life in Color with Nickelbrook. Um, trying to think of what's coming up. I just did a collab with Muddy York. I was like, where was I? Uh, I was at Muddy York on Friday. So we're doing um, a beer that I don't think they've talked about yet. So keep it under your hats, but it's a foreign export stout, which is huge in the Caribbean. And not a lot of breweries out here do it. The, uh, yeah, the only other one that's done it so far was Little Beasts. And they did that with Victor North and it was absolutely fantastic. So that's happening. Um, I am going to be doing a collab with Granite Brewing in the next couple of weeks. Then I'm going back to People's Pint because we do probably about two or three a year. Uh, the last one we did was called Walk It Off and it was a, a pale ale. Uh, we called it Walk It Off because Peter and I both injure ourselves quite often and we just are like, nope, I'm good. I'm just going to walk it off. Um, and we had hurt, we'd both like, you know, not together hurt ourselves very badly um, within within a few weeks of, of doing the brew. So it, it made it uh, pretty hilarious. But yeah, so I think that those are the next ones. And then Merit, uh, we're just trying to figure out timing. It'll probably be at the end of the year. You've been busy. Yeah. It's a little quieter than usual. <laughs> I think last year I did 16 collabs. Yeah. So this year it's, uh, it's you know, I'm slacking this year. Because, <laughs> you know, Utah came back from Short Finger. Uh, yeah, like there was, it was a lot. It's This was the year of returns. A lot of redos or, or double batches of things. Okay. Let me rephrase that. You've been really busy for someone in COVID-19. <laughs> With everything that's going on, how do you stay grounded? Um, I think the, the, the good thing about COVID is being home. 
Um, I do have a general anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, so um, which no one ever believes, but, and I'm also really shy when it comes to new people. So being able to work from home and do Zoom calls and then kind of decide if I wanna go out has been really fantastic for me. Um, being in the office, I actually share the office with my wife. So we, we have a, a row of desks across the wall and the cats are wandering around and stuff. So um, having some kind of normal while I'm talking about very heavy topics is really great. Like occasionally one of the cats will walk across the table and I'm just like, I'm at home. Uh, so it, it makes it, it makes it um, more, more fun. So yeah, that's, that's the big piece being, being at home and being in, in my space has been fantastic. It's good. I think that we're all used to strange things happening in Zoom calls. And speaking of cats, Graham, I love tuxedo cats. That's that's fantastic. <laughs> and um, I mean, I've had my grandson come running in to tell me that the next door neighbor's dog killed the rabbit in the middle of a Zoom call. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> I love my grandkids. <laughs> Looks like cat night. Yeah, it's totally. I know my my cats are locked out tonight. <laughs> Anyways, I'm I'm looking at my list of questions because I was all over the place with them. You beer diversity two and a half years now. Yeah, just over. What's changed for you since you founded that, created it? Uh, I, I think I'm finally running with it in a way that I'm really happy because I fell into it. I, you know, I didn't plan to, to have this as a company. So, um, I mean, a, a few of you, like I sold to both Bill and Troy, right? So it was like, I was your sales rep for a bunch of years through a bunch of different breweries. And I, I didn't think that I was going to suddenly have a consulting and advocacy company um, so I think that the first like three to six months were kind of the like, what am I doing? How did I get here? Why are people listening to me? And once it, it really started to pick up and I was able to start traveling and talk to people um, and, and kind of get in with, with the diversity and inclusion crew in the States who are dealing with, with alcohol and, and diversity, um, I started to feel really secure in all of this and, and making all these great connections. So the big changes are, I believe what I say, and I've always believed it, but now I like really believe it. There's no doubt about it. And, you know, I mean, what I'm talking about is my lived experience. So it's weird to be like, eh, I don't know about this. It's like, nope, people are, are kind of crappy to people of color and beer and here's why. And here are things that we need to, to think about. So it's, I, I think that I, feel secure about what I'm talking about and planning. There's a lot of, there's a lot of planning that suddenly is, is happening where I think before I was just like, if this happens, cool. If it doesn't, cool. And so now I'm at the like, I would like to see this happen in three months, six months, 12 months, three years. So I feel like a grown up. I feel like a weirdo grown up. <laughs> <laughs> Big change. Yeah, it's weird. We're going we're gonna to take a small little commercial break right now. I'm going to flip everybody over to Aliens Exist. Ryan, did you want to talk about it or do you want me to talk about it? Do it, Ryan, do it. About aliens or about Midnight Bike Club? Aliens? But aliens exist. Uh, I like to mix my aliens with a pale ale to get more head retention. That's my opinion on it. But... Uh, um... It's like not sour enough, but it's not pale ale enough. So it's just kind of riding that line. Um, but yeah, if you have another Midnight Bike Club, I like to dump uh, half of that in there very aggressively to get a nice foamy head. But, Interesting. Yeah. I would never have thought to put Midnight Bike Club. Anyways, um, it's a funky pale, he calls it a funky pale ale fermented on the in-house yeast and bacteria culture. And then they aged it on second use um, dry hops and conditioned it in the can. All cost saving techniques by rub. 
<laughs> That's right, and of course. That can use hops. Yep. Yep. Oh wow. Yes, that is definitely very, very funky. There's so Ren. I used to be a server. As soon as people put something in their mouth, you ask them a question. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Graham's had a question. Describe the perfect contact that you would like to spend 30 minutes with. Like, is this an alive or dead moment? Or is it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you choose whether it's alive or dead. <sighs> oh, man. Um... I think I would, oh man, Graham. I would like to spend some some real time alive and generalized, okay. Um, oh man, I, I'm like blanking. I'm just like, ooh, who do I wanna spend time with? Uh, there's so many people and they're like all in my head now. Um, can I come back to that? <laughs> okay, we'll come back to that. I'll switch back to my list of questions. I'll ask you another question. In your interview with the Food uh, Network, you uh, talked about boosting the signal. Yep. What is the best way for all of us here who have joined in in this uh, chat to help boost that signal? I think it's pretty easy. It's, you know, if you're on social media and you're on Instagram or Facebook, talk about your favorite things that involve BIPOC or LGBTQ plus peoples who are doing cool things. You know, like I said, Mona takes really great photos. She's a woman of color, like go check her out. And I think it takes no time and it can be, this is my favorite band. This is my favorite painter or whatever. And, you know, if they're local, like talk about Trisha, I don't know, like, you know, it's just these like quick, hey, I saw a painting, like Trisha's stuff is in downtown Kitchener. So you can just take a photo and tag it and say, I really love her work. And every time I see it, you know, I think whatever. Um, so I think that, that people get scared about signal boost and they always think it costs money. And it's like, it doesn't. You literally just, I mean, you tell people about your favorite restaurant and they never go, but they're like, it sounds really good. Um, it's the same thing about like, I really love this Netflix show. And then people go check it out, right? Like it's, that's how simple it should be. And it's, it, people, you know, I find that, that it overcomplicates and it's just like, yes, think of it that way. I really love this thing. So maybe you'll love it too. I really love this person who's doing something different. Um, you know, people to follow on Instagram, like I'm obsessed with Notorious Cree. His videos are fantastic. Um, so I think that just, yeah, talking, talking about it in just general, general terms, nothing big and, and fancy. Baby steps. Baby steps. Yeah. Baby steps. Yeah. Are you ready to go back to Graham's question? Um, no, because I blanked on the name of the person I want to sit with and I'm casually looking it up because I'm <laughs> bad with names. Can I just generalize what, I, what I'm driving at is describe the persona, not necessarily a person, but I love spending time with musicians or a person who's got this description. I could spend 30 minutes with Bill because of who he is. Right. Um, I don't love spending time with people. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I would go for like a type of person because it's like, I love musicians, but like when you spend time with them, you're like, I'm going to casually make this look like an accident. Um, so I think that, yeah, I, I love spending time with beer people, but there's like a certain kind of beer person I don't like spending time with. Um, yeah, I just, um, the, the person I was thinking of that I actually want to spend time with is Garrett Oliver, um, who is Brooklyn Brewer, like he's Brooklyn Brewery. And I've been really lucky to spend a few minutes with him a couple of times. And that man has forgotten more than all of us have learned combined. So he's, he is like, such a gentleman he is a beer nerd he likes to use big words and he cooks fancy food according to his instagram so um i would want to hang out with someone like that for like you know 30 minutes max i 
I'm still struggling with you don't really like to be around people and you're shy because I remember the first time I met you and neither one of those descriptions would be remotely close to how I would have described no. that. And I like that's what everyone says, though. But I was also sitting with Ed, I think, the first time. Like, I was surrounded by people I knew when I met you. So that always makes a big difference. But I also, I have a, like 20 years of experience with call centers. So I am very, I'm like, I will give you what you need and I will make you happy because I never want to talk to you again. So <laughs> it's like, it, it kind of carried over into, into sales. But yeah, I think like if I had my choice, I'd probably just stay at home with my wife and cats, like occasionally do Zoom calls. So basically how I'm living right now. <laughs> so this is all because of you, okay. <laughs> if you could travel back in time, what advice would you give your younger self? Oh man, I feel like if I if I showed up back in time and my younger self saw me, my younger self would probably beat me up and be like, "You got soft, man." Um, <laughs> I think the first thing I said would be like, "Listen, there's this thing called Bitcoin, and it doesn't sound real, but buy into it." Um, also, Google, just get Google stock. I think that I would I would tell my younger self to like not worry about stuff as much. And just go with what you love. I mean, I had corporate jobs for a very long time and I hated it. Um, you know, like most people, we get into these corporate worlds and it's like, this is what I need to do. And, and I think I would just say like, you just have to make it through this because at the other end, it's going to be super rad and you're going to really love it. Also, you're going to have way more tattoos. So just hold on. It's going to be great. Bitcoin. <laughs> and Google. And Google. <laughs> Facebook. Nah, I don't worry about Twitter. Facebook. I, I think like Bitcoin and Google, that's where it's at. I, I hope you saw your invite to share some beer from Ryan. Yes. Oh, Ryan. Yes. So, so in. Yeah, I'm there. How many tattoos do you have now? Uh, I don't count them anymore because they're now like in sleeves. So um, I'm basically tattooed from like here down to my ankles. So that's, I started out with two and now it's just, I'm covered. What was the first one? Uh, the first one was a small cross and actually was the, um, the the it was like a whole religious thing but it wasn't it's kind of like the knights templar type thing um and then i think my second tattoo was a small japanese symbol for strength and determination which i had translated before i got it so my brother speaks fluent japanese and my sister-in-law is japanese so uh back in the day i was like you need to translate this and you need to tell me for real otherwise i will kill you and he told me what it, it meant. I was like, perfect, because that's what it says on the sheet. So cool. Off I go. So those are my first two. <laughs> what was the uh, the drive to have those tattoos on? Uh, they, they were both symbols of strength. And I think that I am the person who needs reminders and like little touchstones. And it's just it's so cheesy, but like, I would say 97% of my tattoos mean something. There's, there are a few where it's like, I won this one for Halloween, uh, literally. Uh, this one is a group tattoo, and this one is a bottle and a bottle opener. Um, but like the rest all have like these deep meanings. So I'm just, I'm that person. What was your mom's reaction? Uh, when I started getting them, she, her only request was that I could cover them up because I was still working in corporate land. And the second I got out of corporate land, I got my hands done. So <laughs> I could never get a real job. <laughs> I mean, it totally could, but whatever. <laughs> Troy said, tell yourself when to sell Blackberry too. Yeah. <laughs> I was never into Blackberry. I don't think I, I would have even like have thought about it. So, so just before Blackberry reached its peak, 
in the dot com in, in, in 2000, every man, woman, child, dog and cat on the planet would have had to have owned a Blackberry to make that work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Just checking my list of questions for you. Oops. I'm out, I'm out of questions. Oh no, we're in trouble. We're now going to have to have a conversation. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's totally fine by me. I mean, it's you know, it could be worse. Yeah. 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 I mean, it like, could be. But it's fine. Ryan, when we can travel again, where would you go first? Um, I I lost a lot of travel this year with with the like initial COVID stuff happening. I was supposed to go to Florida. I don't want to go to Florida ever, so that's off the list anyway. Um, yeah, right. Like uh, I wanted. I was also supposed to do a lot of travel through BC, so uh, I was supposed to basically be out traveling throughout BC for work for about a month. So uh, I'd go to BC and go travel around. Also my mother-in-law is out there and I really miss her. So uh, BC. Yes, I found it. People either love the East Coast or the West Coast. Yeah, I know, eh? That's... I'm, I'm just an East Coast kind of guy. Yeah, I want to, well, I want to go back to Halifax too, but it's like, I would start, I would do BC and then and kind of back. Uh, I totally understand that. You've got family out there. You've got a reason to go. But yeah, Halifax. That's... Halifax is interesting. What's your favorite brewery out there? Uh, I would say North. Yeah. They're, they're doing a lot of really cool stuff with, um, with the community. They just did a, they launched a scholarship uh, about a month and a half ago and have been really verbal about what they're supporting and what they're not. So they are standing with the indigenous fishermen uh, with the whole uh, kerfuffle over lobsters and they're right, they're actual <laughs> right to, to fish it. So it's nice to see a place not just be about beer and say like, yo, we're not cool with what's currently happening and this is who we stand with. So North is my favorite. Um, I really dig two crows. Uh, Tide House, who are incredibly quiet, but they do such, right? Like such good stuff. Yes. Um, and also the smallest tap room. So pre-COVID, I think it was like a seven-seater or an eight-seater. So uh, it's, yeah, it's great. Wow. Derek wants to know where he can nerd out on beer during the pan, or Naomi wants it. It's going to be a long winter. <laughs> and then um, on top of that, What's your favorite brewery in Milton? Isn't there only one in Milton and isn't it Third Moon? <laughs> I was thinking that, but I thought maybe that's there's it. a new that's one. It. Yeah, it's, it's Third Moon. <laughs> Third Moon is my favorite. That was an easy one. I just thought I'd give you a, a gimme. A soft one. Thanks for that. <laughs> I, have, I have a bunch of Third Moon in the fridge, so uh, I'm looking forward to getting into the rest of it. Um, for Beard and Nerd Out on, Oh man, there's such good stuff coming out. I really want to get my hands on Slake. They're the new brewery in Prince Edward County, which, yeah, I'm hearing like really great things about them. So um, I will probably bop over to the sidewalk at Princess Cafe and just get it there because I'm not making it to Prince Edward County. Um, they're, they're, yeah, they're doing great stuff. There's like a bunch of Prince Edward County breweries that are doing great things out there. Um, but again, like Mark's bringing in most of that stuff. So really just go talk to Mark and be like, what's new? Cause there's, I think he's continuously bringing in stuff and he just posted, I think it was today that he was at third moon picking up like a ton of stuff. So um, yeah, I would just follow whatever Mark brings in. Cause that's, that's how I've been doing it. This has been going and picking up a ton of stuff. So. I hear you. Chirag wants to know East coast or West coast, which style of the IPA do you enjoy? West coast. <laughs> See, I, I would have worded it differently. Do you like the uh, the West Coast or the hazy New England style now? 
yeah, I was like whatever. Oh, Orange Snail is Evan Milton. Right, I forgot about that. Every time I hear about Orange Snail, I think of York University because I went to York and Stong College, which is the college I was affiliated with, our pub was called the Orange Snail. And they lost their liquor license uh, several years after I left because no one checked fully when they were closing down and someone had passed out drunk under the pool table. And when he woke up, he freaked out about where he was and threw a table through a window to get out of said pub. So that's what I think of when I hear orange snail. <laughs> Ren, are there any like Zoom like events or like learning stuff for beer that's happening like in addition to what Bill does here? I um, my stuff is all is all private right now. I'm actually not doing anything for the public, which is super weird. Um, but I, uh, I just signed up for Two Faces, the bar in Guelph. They're doing um, a wine education on November 19th. You just have to message them for the Zoom, the Zoom link. But yeah, I haven't, personally, I'm not doing stuff and I haven't really seen a lot of public stuff that's, that's really worth jumping on. So maybe I'll just start doing it and, and do some public sessions, have some fun with it. going too fast for me to get it all um oh yeah wellington wellington's doing beer education but they don't always do it so yeah. wellington brewery is just starting it again and the first one's tomorrow and i think it's only a three or four week thing that they're doing um but otherwise no one's doing it on a regular basis i think that uh breweries especially are still just trying to figure out what the hell's going on with all the the ontario rules and legislations and yes you can have people in no you can't have people in you can't do this so um i don't think that there's a lot that's really happening on a regular basis. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll take a look at it and maybe I'll do it. <laughs> Add something to my plate. There's a question further back on the stream that asked um, BIPOC breweries that you would recommend that, you know, to expand their under, our understanding and knowledge of, of people other than the white guys in, in the beer industry. Yeah. There are very few BIPOC breweries in Canada. Um, like, when I think so for BIPOC, there is Lost Craft. Uh, like, yeah. it's, it's not it's not much. Um, yeah, I, I think there's like one other brewery and I always forget. I, like, it's honestly, there's, there's almost nothing owned by, by people of color in Ontario. Um, outside of Ontario, it's not much better. North Brewing, uh, Rosina is, I believe, East Indian background. Uh, there is the Changes Brewing Collective, which is led by Geo, and Geo is one of the brewers at Good Robot, again, in Halifax. And they are doing um, collaborative brews, so they're popping around and doing, so they've done three brews so far. They did one at Good Robot, um, one at North, and one at two crows. So that's happening in Canada, but really in terms of owning a brewery, there's not much. And then in terms of BIPOC working at breweries, um, Noel, who is one of the brewers at Great Lakes, but like no one ever sees him, he hides out. You'll, I mean, I know he exists because I work with him, um, but like otherwise he's kind of poker root. like you'll always have just missed him. Um, but yeah, there's like, there's not a, a, a lot. BIPOC are, are starting to show up in the sales forces, but again, like in such tiny numbers. So I don't, I don't think it's at a lost craft. That's the only one that really shows up. Ryan, for sure. I will find you one because you need to open a brewery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Ryan, we'll we'll check that one out for you. <clears throat> Got to go to the next beer. I'm not going to open it because I want to share this with my wife. Uh, bigger than Kiss. Ryan, do you want to talk about it? Yeah, this one's uh, super cool. Uh, I think Rob aged it for the normal one without cherries two years in tequila barrels. Yes. The one with cherries, probably an extra six months. So like two and a half years. And then another year on top in bottles. Um, 
the non cherry one, I think, is it the non cherry one we're drinking? No, I well, I've got the non cherry one. Yeah, I think that one's the better one. The cherry one's just uh, too sour, kind of ruins all that aging that was done for the first two years and just blasts it with way too much uh, sharp sour sourness. But uh, yeah, the non cherry one's definitely the better of the two, in my opinion. So yeah, enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ren, philosophical question. Yeah. Sort of the last one that I always ask. What would you like everybody here tonight to take away from our chat? Uh, that life is too short to be angry at people. Um, you know, it's kind of that like, don't hold on to the anger because uh, it just doesn't get anywhere. And I think that I, it's, you know, kind of the thing that I keep putting on my Instagram posts, kind of ending them with like, let's do better. Let's be better. Wash your damn hands. And I love you. <laughs> that's, and I think that that's the big piece, right? It's, you know, during a pandemic, we, we all got so caught up in our own heads that we forgot that there were people out there who needed something. And that even, even though we say like, it's just beer, there's so much more that we can do. Like you see all these collaborations coming out and, you know, Black is Beautiful being brewed by what, like 1200 different breweries across the world and everyone kind of doing their own little twist on it by helping communities with a beer. Like whether that community is big in beer or not, they still benefited from it. And I think that we have to remember that it's not just beer and we can do so much more and we're able to educate each other, right? Like the, the label for nothing civil is like, you gotta, you, you have to take that in. That's not just a like, oh, it's a beer label, it's cute, whatever. And I think that breweries are now seeing that and they're starting to say, oh, I can put more on it. Um, Persephone in BC puts a land acknowledgement and explains how they have learned from the indigenous peoples around them. So I think that we have to slow down and say, okay, there's so much more to beer. I can use the bottle or the can as the vessel to get not just a tasty beverage out, but to get a message and get a really deep, impactful message. So I think that you know, hopefully we start all thinking about that together. And, and again, you know, with that signal boost and the highlighting, highlighting the places that are doing it right and the places that you feel are making some changes. Who's doing it right? Um, I would say the Counterpoint. Hey, Graham. Uh, Counterpoint does some really fantastic stuff. So like one of their last collaborative releases was Aaron Francis and Chef Tennille Warren. Um, you know, both giving nods to their Jamaican heritage, which I totally missed and I'm super bummed out that I missed it. Um, but doing that and then, you know, having so many more pieces tied into it, like, you know, there was the food and, and uh, Aaron Francis does vintage Canada, so he does photography and he's like showing the history of his family in Canada. And, you know, so they're like those pieces plus the beer. Uh, Shortfinger always does things great. The amount of stuff that they do with the community and just highlighting and signal boosting. Um, Wellington is really, is really stepped it up. Uh, when we did the label review and they were like, yeah, okay, cool. I almost fell off my chair. I, I just didn't expect it. And since then they've been putting up uh, their current sign says that black lives still matter. So, and that's, you know, that huge sign that you see is you either drive into Guelph or out. It's been up for, for a couple of weeks now. Um, uh, Merit is doing pretty great stuff. Grain and Grit, which is in Hamilton. Um, I'm also really lucky to have, have benefited from some of the stuff that Grain and Grit's doing. They've been helping me out a lot with, with some of the work I'm doing and have created a fund to like help me get a little further with some things. So that's been cool. Uh, Dominion City, which it's, uh, they're, yeah, they're, they're pretty awesome. So I think that those are like, you know, the ones I think of immediately. Muddy York, Gates, um a few beers where they were like we're gonna give money to like all of these charities and if you don't like it don't buy our beer and they are very outspoken about it so i think you know they they're uh, they're at that point where they're like yep yeah, if you don't like it cool well we're not gonna we're not gonna make it easier and, and kind of lay back and be like it's fine so so we have made some baby steps in the last two years is what you're saying yeah, and I think that there's still baby steps, right? Like Ontario's got 400 breweries. I mean, whenever I start listing breweries that are doing it right, I probably stop at about 20. So we've got a long way to go. I mean, there's 
you know, and it's, it's not about them just making good beer. It's like, what are your labels? What are your values? Like, what are you saying to people? Cause I mean, there's still breweries out there where I'm like, I'm not drinking your beer, but I'm here to fight you. <laughs> like, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much like now on record a couple times. Like I am not a fan of forefathers. They had a lot of moments where they could have addressed what was happening and they didn't. And while it was all going on, they were talking about doing their saint series where each of the owners would have a beer named for him as a saint. And I was like, are you on crack? So, you know, and, and when the George Floyd video came out, they were the first to call me to ask what charity they should work with instead of just Googling it. So I'm not a fan. I hear you. I hear you. The coffee, uh, the coffee roasters in Woodstock a couple of weeks ago did a whole thing on uh, uh, murdered and missing indigenous women. And um, they, they had 62 photographs with the bio, bio of the person that was missing. And they raised 20, I think it was $2,300 for um, Six Nations. So, so important. Yep. They, uh, they felt it was an important thing to do. Yeah. So. But you're right. It is still just baby steps. We, we've got a long ways to go. Yeah. Oh, Derek. Yes, we'll do that as an after off the record question. Are there any businesses or breweries or causes close to the indigenous community in Ontario or out east that you really like and want to shout out? Um, I think that the, those who are trying to work with groups or at least, you know, kind of benefit in a way. Um, Catalyst just did a brew. So Catalyst is in Whitby, Durham, help me out. Uh, I can't remember where they are. They're really lovely. Anyway, they're in Ontario. Uh, they just did a brew with Mark Solomon, who is up north brewing on Instagram, and he is indigenous and is incredibly outspoken, and I love him. Um, so they just did a, a collab where they actually brought in an indigenous artist to design all the, the the artwork for the can. So that just came out a week or two ago, so that's really fresh. Um, again, for Ontario, there hasn't really been a lot that I think are making definitive dances about things they're just kind of doing the like overarching like we want everyone to be cool and like maybe donate some money um north brewing um i think i think two crow two crows has said stuff uh they've definitely been been pretty outspoken but i don't have anyone like off the tip of my tongue i know um for grain and grit they do uh weekly trivia and the first Thursday of every month is a different group to donate to. And the last two were indigenous groups that um, a spot in Hamilton we're working with. So they are, they're highlighting that way, but otherwise, yeah, I don't think there's a lot. Um, and then because, you know, people are, are scared about the notion of indigenous peoples and the stigma of alcohol. And so a lot of breweries are just like, we're not going to talk about it at all. And I think that's really unfair because there are, um, a handful of Indigenous brewers currently working in Ontario that obviously people just don't know about. And it's, I think it's unfair to them to, to just decide, well, we're not going to talk about it because of the stigma of alcohol. So, Yeah, that's a, a tough one sometimes for people yeah. to get their head around. Yeah. And I just, I don't think it's fair to make the decision for the group. Yeah. I think that if you are doing something that's charitable, yes, talk to the group that you wish to help because, you know, I mean, it's it's the same with um, with women's shelters. Like, you know, some of those women are, are beaten by alcoholics. They don't exactly want to advertise that they just got beer money, but it's make, you know, let them have the decision. Don't you make the decision for them? Yeah, Jackie and I had that conversation the other day because I was going, there's a couple of people I know down in Six Nations that are brewing and I was like, should I approach them or not? And she goes, you talk to them, let them make the call. Yeah. It's, their, it's their call. It's not yours, which is very true. Yeah. So, so I still struggle with that rural white conservative upbringing that I had in the, from the sixties. <laughs> Getting there, but I still struggle sometimes. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. 
I think we all like we all struggle with it, right? Because yeah. the, the the thing that that stops us all in our tracks is that that fear of offending and making mistakes. So if I don't say anything, then I won't make a mistake and I won't offend anyone. That's not true. It's not true. It's not <laughs> That's true. not true at all. Nope. <laughs> Silence speaks volumes. Yeah, it really does. I yep. mean, that's, you know, and that, that's been a big thing through, through the last like five, six months that, you know, how many breweries and how many places are you suddenly watching and wondering why they haven't said anything? And, you know, why aren't they doing anything with their communities? And it's just, it's, it's a lot. So Catalyst is in Bracebridge. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Of course, Graham was doing further north. <laughs> Ryan wants to know if you fight for more diversity in beer styles. Yes, I do because is that also ties in with just the notion of diversity and inclusion. I mean, you had made that really awesome street beer and you know, the style of that is not something that is the norm for North American markets. Um, foreign export stouts, the reason I'm excited about it is because I know about it. I'm from Trinidad and it's a Caribbean beer and North American breweries do not make beer for black people. <laughs> like, sorry, I can't say it any other way. Like, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing specific. Like we have Oktoberfest lagers and we have Marzins and we have things that are like, they're, they're specific to specific groups of people, but we don't, we don't stand outside of that. So yeah, I really do because I think that getting out of that comfort zone and learning and educating yourself and realizing that, oh my God, other countries make beer, um, you know, and it's really important. So yeah, I do. And I'm really, I'm really trying to educate myself too on what's out there. Um, there's a bunch of places in the States that are, are making beer with African ingredients that they're, I don't even know how they're sourcing half of it, but they're doing these really cool twists on them. And if you know Ed and Mio, so T Dot Drinks and Craft Beer Phoenix, they've done some Black is Beautiful collabs in Toronto and they've been able to, to add like Caribbean flares to it where a lot of people are like, I don't know what that is. And I'm like, sugar cake, you don't know what that is? I mean, it's just coconut and sugar. Um, but like black people go crazy for it. So it's just, yeah, like I think that we need to, we need to expand the diversity of like actual beer. Wait. Ren, I want to thank you again for, for being on show number 25 for me. I was uh, so excited when you agreed to do this three months back. You know, And oh, by the way, did not even consider the fact it was election night three months ago. Yeah. I... <laughs> so, but uh, I want to thank you for, uh, for being on the show. You're always such a gracious guest and help enlighten us and help us move forward in, in learning to be better people all around thank you <laughs> and i have a couple of i have a question and a couple of announcements the first one being graham and i are doing a collab on tuesday for christmas we've got it we've got it sorted out so and uh the question that i have do you want to show on the 29th of december Everyone's nodding your head, yes, no, yes, okay. I will work at getting a guest for the 29th of December now. <laughs> Ren, what are you doing after Christmas? No. Nothing, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> like the rest of us, I'm not going anywhere, can't go anywhere. Pretty much. Yeah. And um, Peter Lenardin has graciously, along with David Hussey, agreed to sort of commentate the after show off the record part when we move into the election in the US because we, we, it's got such a big impact on all of us, whether we want to admit it or not. But Ren, again, thank you for being on the show. Always a pleasure and to have you back in the future again. We've got Thanks so many having. things to talk about. Yeah, we always do. Thanks yeah. friends, it's so good. I am now gonna stop recording.